I'm going to talk about uh, classical and digital topological groups. Please let me know if you have questions. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, and I hope you can all see my, my screen well. Um, that uh, graphic, uh, this everything that I'm going to say is in a paper that I uh, wrote this summer with um, Professor Daewoon Lee, uh, who is in Korea. And um, the, um, the paper is just called Digital Topological Groups. It's on the archive if anybody wants to see it. Um, the, the graphic that you can see in the background there is uh, kind of has nothing to do with anything, but I recently got uh, access. I, got, I made myself a free account for the DAL-E um, AI art generator. And this is what you get if you type um, classical and digital topological groups. It, cr it created that picture, which I thought, it's a nice picture. It doesn't really look like anything that I'm going to be talking about, but I like the picture. Uh, actually, if you, um, if you zoom out, this is what the rest of it looks like. It, it has some weird stuff over on the side. I don't know what that, it looks kind of like words, but it's not. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, classical and digital topological groups is what I want to talk about. So I thought, I thought I'd start with just like a little information about uh, classical topological groups. Um, classical just means sort of not digital. You know, um, most of the, the paper is all about this kind of digital topology, which is an attempt to do topology but in the setting of sort of digital objects, that is things which are made up of individual pixels rather than smooth kind of ordinary topological shapes. And in digital topology, when we say classical, we mean like not digital. So first let's just talk about topological groups, the classical theory. Um, a topological group is a, a uh, topological space, which is also a group. And um, the group operations have to be continuous with respect to the topology so that there is some kind of compatibility between the topological space and the group structure. And, um, you know, the notation I'm going to use here is uh, I'm going to write mu for the multiplication, the product, and then this iota for the inverse. And those two, um, in order for it to be a, like a legal topological group, those two operations must be continuous. All right. Um, like, for example, the sort of simplest examples, um, R2 with plus or R1, Rn with, with addition is a topological group because addition is continuous when you consider it with respect to the ordinary topology on Rn. All right. Or even something like Z2, um, if you consider only the integers, um, that's a topological group, although it's, it's not very interesting topologically because it's kind of like a discrete, discrete topology. But, I mean... It's a group, at least, uh, and you can put the discrete topology on it if you want, and it becomes a topological group. Um, or a more interesting example would be the circle. Um, S1, I'm talking about just the points on the sort of the edge of the circle. And you can define an operation, add points together according to their angles. So here you can use the operation where uh, the product of, you know, two x's with different angles is you just add the two angles together and you get another another point on the circle, and the inversion is just doing minus the angle, all right? That's a topological group. Or here's a more sophisticated one, GL2R, that's all the, the um, topological space of all two by two invertible ma matrices uh, with real entries, and you can use the matrix multiplication and the matrix inverse, and that makes a topological group. Uh, the matrix multiplication and inverse are continuous using the ordinary uh, topology on, I guess, R4 in this case. You have four real coordinates in the matrix. All right. This one is uh, interesting because it's not an abelian group. It's a group, but it's, you know, not abelian, uh, not commutative, the operation. And it's topologically interesting, I guess, a little bit because it's disconnected. This one, um, you have some, these are all matrices with non-zero determinant. Some of them have determinant uh, positive and some have negative determinant. And topologically, you can't get from a positive determinant matrix along a smooth path to a negative determinant matrix without going through zero, which would leave the space in this case. So this, uh, this one is a disconnected topological group. All right. That's some basic examples. And here's um, the, the uh, important easy theorem that you need to know about topological groups. And it, it's not hard to prove this at all. But if you um, take any element in the group and let mu x be multiplication by x. So it is a function which just multiplies everything by uh, some particular element. Then mu x is a homeomorphism of the group onto itself. That means that it is uh, continuous 
and it has uh, its inverse is continuous because in a group you can multiply by the inverse, and that's also continuous. And it's a uh, it's a bijection. Um, it has uh, you know it has inverses, right? Uh, mu x is a homeomorphism. If that is uh, this is like the fundamental notion of equivalence in topology. So basically, a homeomorphism is one which doesn't topologically change the shape at all. You could it could be like a rotation or. A, uh, some kind of rigid motion, but it doesn't um, change the topology of the shape. All right, multiplication by x is a homeomorphism. This immediately implies a lot of things about any topological group. Um, first of all, it means that any topological group is automatically a homogeneous space. What that means is that basically, topologically speaking, every point looks the same as every other point on in some kind of local sense. Uh, because you can use these multiplications to carry any point x onto any other point, say y, by multiplication by something, um, that means, since that's a homeomorphism, it means the neighborhood around x must be basic, topologically identical to the neighborhood around any other point. So that's called the homogeneous space. And then also, um, this doesn't exactly follow, but it's also true. All components of G, like um, if you look at G, if G happens to be disconnected into a bunch of different pieces, all the pieces have to be homeomorphic to one another. They're all topologically equivalent because these multiplications can carry one component onto another one, and they are homeomorphism. So all the components, if you're looking at this thing and you can see it, its shapes, um, it might break down into a bunch of separate components, but all those components, they look the same. They're all uh, homeomorphic to one another. All right, so for example, this shape here, the circle I said uh, is a topological group, but this shape cannot be a topological group because it's not a homogeneous space. That point right in the middle there, um, the point in the middle looks different from all the other points. It, the neighborhood around that point has sort of four paths coming out of it, uh, whereas the neighborhood around any other point has only two paths coming out of it. So that thing right there uh, is not homogeneous and therefore it cannot be a topological group. Uh, but this one could be a topological group. It has two separate uh, components, but they, they are homeomorphic to one another. And in fact, this one actually, you can give it a group structure. You can give it a group structure of the group of S1 that I said before, and then a product with Z2 that is just it, it, two separate copies of S1, basically. All right. A little important technicality, and then we're going to get into the, the digital stuff. Um, this thing, part of the definition of a topological group, is that this product operation is continuous. And um, it is required to be continuous using the product topology. I'm saying the domain here, G cross G, is a product of two topological spaces. What does it mean to say this thing is continuous? Well, you, there's a standard way of making a product um, of, two of two topological spaces. And there's a way of talking about um, this product as being another topological space, and that's how you define the, the continuity. All right, this continuity is, uh, you know, we talk about this kind of thing sometimes in like a multivariable calculus. We require this to be continuous in both variables together, and in some situations, this is not quite the same as requiring that it's continuous in each variable separately. All right, this is a function of two variables. We require that it's continuous in both variables simultaneously which is not always the same as continuous in one variable, leaving the other fixed, and then continuous in the other variable, leaving the first one fixed. All right, that's a little technicality. Um, so a, just terminology. A topological group is one in which the product is continuous in both variables simultaneously. Actually, there is a word for when it's continuous only in one variable at a time. This is obscure, and I didn't know this word before I looked this up for, you know, just for this project. Um, if the product is continuous in each variable separately, that's called a quasi-topological group, all right? Topologists like to have sort of cute little words for, for every little technicality, and, and this is the word for if it's like a topological group, but it's not continuous in both variables simultaneously, only continuous in one variable at a time. And there are examples of things which are quasi-topological groups, but they're not topological groups. Uh, obscure and weird examples. Um, I put one uh, R with the plus operation and the co-compact topology. That is, you declare a set to be open when its complement is a compact set. This is a weird topology on R. But anyway, that turns out to be a quasi-topological group, but it's not a topological group. The continuity is only one variable at a time. These are weird examples, all right? 
Uh, here's a little fun fact. There's also something that what I just said was a quasi topological group. There's also something called a topological quasi group. And that's that's different. It's something else because there is something called a quasi group, which is like a group, but it has no inverses. But it does have a uh, cancellation property. That's a quasi group. And then you can make a topological quasi group. Yeah. Um, just for fun, there's also something called a semi topological group and a topological semi group. There, these things exist. And Anyone want to guess what I'm about to say? There is such a thing as a semi-topological semi-group. Yeah, there's even um, there's even a book about, this is a book called, a Springer book, Compact Semi-Topological Semi-Groups. I don't know anything about this. I just think it's silly, the names. Um, okay, anyway, that was my, my 10 minute review of classical topological groups. All right, let's talk about the digital then. Um, Here's another uh, AI generated artwork. I typed in for this one, digital topological group with Anna and Elsa, and that's what I got. Um, I don't know what the words, that, that word at the top means, but actually I like the, um, the picture is not so bad uh, for a digital topological group, and we'll, we'll, we'll see. And the Anna and the Elsa, are, they're kind of identifiable, I guess. Um, anyway, digital topology is about trying to do ordinary topology as best as you can on what we call digital images, which are shapes like this. They are not kind of smooth classical topological shapes, but shapes which are just made up of finitely many kind of indivisible pixels. And what's important about them is just their locations and their kind of proximity to one another. Really all that's important is some of them are next to each other and some of them are not next to each other. But um, we want to build, the goal is to build a theory which somehow resembles classical topology, but for analyzing a finite set like this. And the fact that this is considered to be a finite set, just each pixel is one element, um, that really kind of ruins the traditional approaches to topology because um, there aren't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of natural topologies that you can put on a finite set. For example, if you have a finite set, the only uh, Hausdorff classical topology on a finite set is the discrete topology. So if you want to use a, a topology that resembles the one, say, from R2, it's, it's not going to work because you'll end up with the discrete topology, which is not what you want. Uh, anyway, um, so the idea is to come up with some, some kind of a... Uh, something like classical topology for sets like this. All right, and the approach that was originally kind of articulated by uh, Rosenfeld and was developed in the, uh, in the 90s and, and since by Boxer and others um, is to uh, interpret the digital image as a graph. Um, actually, there are two natural ways to do this. For instance, that, that purple guy on the other thing, you can trans translate that into a graph in at least two natural ways. Here's two different pictures of how you could do it. You could um, determine that points, uh, pixels should be judged as adjacent if they are adjacent in this way, or maybe this way, which allows also diagonal adjacencies. And you just have to kind of choose which way you like. Anyway, um, the, the definition of a, we call it a digital image, is just a set, usually a finite set, in Zn, that is points on the integer lattice, with some kind of adjacency relation defined, some notion of how do you how do you determine if uh, two points are count as being adjacent or not? All right, and the adjacency relation that we use is typically C1 or C2. This one over here is called C1. This one is called C2, and the difference is um, C1 you use no diagonal adjacencies, and in C2 you you do use diagonals. Um, Actually, in higher dimensions, you can do this. These pictures are in like Z2, two dimensions, but you can do it in higher dimensions. And in Zn, we have all higher versions. So the way that this works is C1 uses no diagonals at all. C2 allows additionally diagonals across a two-dimensional face, um, which is what you see here. All these diagonals are going across two-dimensional like squares. Uh, C3 in in one higher dimension, C3 would additionally allow diagonals across solid cubes and so on. All right. These are the normal, uh, the ordinary adjacencies that we typically would use. All right. Do you ever, do you ever use um, other lattices other than a, um, you know, ZN, like triangular lattice? Uh, 
No, I, I think in the early days there was some some of the papers uh, addressed that, but people have m more or less focused on the the ZN lattice. Although um, almost everything that I say is actually not specific to ZN with these with these adjacencies, but uh, more most of the work is done on the level of just abstract graphs anyway, and so if you want to, you can stick you. you you just consider any graph, and if you want to, you can stick it into an integer lattice or some other lattice. Although the analogy with digital images, I think the integer lattice is the most natural just because that's what digital images look like in the real world. But yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, as you can see in this example, your choice, whether you're using C1 or C2 or whatever, leads to different topological properties. For instance, the one on the left is disconnected, but the one on the right is connected. So it really does matter, and no one or the other is like more natural than the other one. It's just you, you just choose which one you're using. Um, this is unlike in, in classical topology, there is kind of a standard topology that you basically always use in R2. The, the standard topology, right? Th there is no standard adjacency in, in, these, in this theory. There's kind of a few different ones. All right, the digital topological properties, you know, classical topology, everything is defined in terms of open sets, but in, in this theory, there are no open sets. You just have these adjacencies. And so instead of using open sets as the basis for everything, we define everything in terms of uh, continuous functions. So here's the definition of continuity. Uh, if you have a function like this, we say it's digitally continuous. I'm just going to say continuous. If um, when two points, this little arrow means adjacent. When two points in the domain are adjacent, then their image is uh, either adjacent or equal. So this is the best you can do in saying something like if you have two points which are close together in the domain, then their images are close together in the codomain. All right. If they're adjacent in the domain, then they map to equal or adjacent points. This is uh, continuity, and we, we're going to define all the topological notions based on that rather than on open sets. All right, that's what I said. Um, so anyway, what's a digital topological group? Well, now that I said all that, it's obvious what this should mean if, if that phrase means anything. It means a digital image, which is also a group so that these functions are both continuous. All right, that's what the definition has to be. Um, the multiplication is uh, you know, a function of two variables and it, uh, the inversion are both required to be digitally continuous in that sense. Two adjacent points map to um, equal or adjacent points. All right, uh, this concept, digital topological group, appears in a paper by Karaja and Is, who is here with us, the Is is at least. Uh, but it's not really their focus, and actually, we when um, when Lee and I started working on this, we didn't know about this paper, but I'm, I'm glad that it was brought to our attention. Um, they kind of used the concept sort of as an example. The, the paper, their paper is really about topological complexity, and they, um, it's, anyway, digital topological groups is not their, their, uh, their real focus, but they did uh, talk about it a little bit. The standard example that you should have in mind is like a copy of the circle. You can do that same kind of circle operation, but you have to turn it into a, a sort of blocky thing. But if you, um, if you turn the circle into this thing, and I label the points like this, then you can consider this with the same type of operation where you add, you're basically adding things up according to their angles around the circle, all right? Uh, you, you read everything mod eight in order to make that work in this particular example. That's the standard example of a digital topological group that you will come up with immediately after thinking about it for a few minutes. All right, actually any, um, any cycle graph that is a graph that, you know, looks like that. Um, makes a digital topological group, which is uh, isomorphic as a group to the integers mod n. Like this one here is the integers mod eight, because there are eight points. Um, this one here, if you give it that same kind of group structure, it's uh, it would give you uh, the group z mod 14. Now it's not like a, uh, it's not a box. It has these weird sort of non-convexity to it, but it, it, that doesn't matter. Uh, topologically speaking, you can make the same uh, operation work out just fine. All right, so this is the standard example of digital topological groups. Um, some big questions that we try to address in the paper are, first of all, which ki what kinds of graphs can be digital topological groups? What kinds of graphs will admit a, a group structure like this? And then also, what kinds of groups can be turned into uh, digital topological groups? So th this is the 
sort of basic things that we're trying to answer in the paper. Um, and here's a simple theorem that, uh, that is similar to the classical situation. Um, if you choose any element and you look at the function of multiplication by x, that gives a graph isomorphism in this theory. So in, in the classical theory that I said the same thing and it gives you a topological homeomorphism, but in the, in the digital case, what you get is a graph isomorphism, an isomorphism of graph. So multiplication by a single element um, basically transforms the graph into like another copy of itself. Um, and so you get the same kind of homogene homogeneity properties in the digital setting as you have in the in the classical topological groups. Um, specifically, uh, this is this is the fact. Given any two points in your digital topological group, there is a graph isomorphism. It's the multiplication by basically x, y inverse or something that carries a uh, point x to another point y. I guess x inverse. Yeah, y, x inverse, something like that. We'll carry x onto y by multiplication. All right. Given any two points, there is a graph isomorphism that takes one of those points to the other one. All right. Um, there's a name for this in graph theory. This is called a vertex transitive graph. And it basically means that every vertex looks the same as every other vertex. It's at least it's um, it's nearby neighborhood. It means a little bit more than that. But that's how I think of this, at least. I'm not a graph theorist, Jeanne Jannar can tell us more, maybe. Um, in particular, one easy corollary, I guess, is this means that all the vertices in your graph have to have the same degree. If there's really an isomorphism carrying every vertex onto any other one, they have to have the same degree. Uh, that is the number of edges which meet that vertex. It's the same across the whole graph. Uh, another thing that this means, which is a little less obvious, but it also means that all components of the graph are uh, isomorphic as graphs. So it's a very similar situation to the, uh, to the classical topological groups situation. All right, so for example, if we look at this, uh, I actually like the looks of this. This does look kind of like a digital image. It's a graph at least, uh, but it is not, a, it cannot be a digital topological group because the degrees of those vertices are not all equal. So the, the AI, I guess, didn't read our paper about that theorem. Um, close. I, not quite, though. All right. Um, also, neither of these graphs can be digital topological groups. There is no way to put a group structure on them that makes it a digital topological group because because of that vertex transitivity. It's not it's not satisfied by these graphs. All right. And actually, the the vertex transitivity is is a very strong condition. Um, uh, like you might imagine, what what could the graph possibly look like? Um, in order for that, that condition to be satisfied about every, every vertex basically has to look like all the other ones. Well, we, we showed that um, in Z2, if you're just talking about in the plane with the C1 adjacency, that's the one with no, no diagonals, then actually in that case, the only connected digital topological group is one of those cycles. So actually the, the circle type examples, that's the only way to do it in the plane using the C1 adjacency. All right. And, and those things, they are their group structure will be um, z, the integer z mod n. All right, so this is a nice nice theorem, I guess. Um, there is an interesting subtlety here that's important. It, it actually, this was something that, that really interested me about this. So far, what I've said is like, in the, in the digital setting, everything is, you get the same kinds of theorems as the classical setting. And that, uh, to me, is always a little unsatisfying. I think what, what interests me about the digital landscape is just the the ways in which it is sometimes different from the classical setting. That, that's more interesting to me. Anyway, there's a subtlety here. Um, I said all along as part of the definition that this multiplication, the product has to be continuous. And again, I, you know, you have to think about what exactly that means with the, um, the domain here. Like I said, in the classical setting, you use what we call the product topology in the domain. But you don't really have that in the digital. So it's worth looking at closely a little bit. It's not obvious how to define adjacency. You have to consider this thing, this product, as, as if it was another digital image, I guess, in like some high dimension. Um, and it's not obvious how to define the adjacencies on that domain x cross x, right? Uh, think of it in terms of graphs. That's a product of two graphs. But actually, if you go, you know, look up the Wikipedia page about graph products, there's a lot of different ways that people have talked about making a product out of graphs. Um, and so there, you know, when I said this is required to be continuous, actually, that's that's ambiguous. You need to say, what exactly do you mean by that? 
uh, graph structure on the domain to, to require the continuity. So um, the issue is here, if I have, say, two different uh, pairs of things in the product, how do you decide if they're going to be declared to be adjacent or not? That's the issue. And there are two standard ways of doing this, and they were articulated by Boxer. He has a paper called, uh, the, I'm referring to the normal product adjacencies. Um, the two standard ways to do this, actually there's more that, that have been talked about, but anyway, um, we, nowadays we call them NP1 and NP2. That's the norm, NP stands for normal product, and either one or two. Um, NP1 means these two pairs are judged to be adjacent if and only if they are equal in one of their coordinates and adjacent in the other. So maybe the first, the first coordinate of each, are, they actually match, they're, they're the same, and then the other two are adjacent or the second coordinate matches and the first two are adjacent, all right? This is we call NP1. The graph theorists call this the box product or the Cartesian product, so they, they have words for these things also. Um, and then, so that was NP1, and then NP2 is, uh, you know, the NP1 adjacencies count, but you also count it as adjacent if both coordinates are adjacent to one another, even if n neither of them are equal to one another. All right, that's called NP2. And in graph theory, this is sometimes called the strong product or the normal product, which is unfortunate because we call them both normal products. But um, NP1 and NP2, actually, in many ways, I don't know if it's clear when I'm, when I'm just describing them here, but in many ways, the, the choice between are you going to use NP1 or NP2 is, is a, in many ways analogous to the choice between C1 and C2. It's about do you allow for diagonal adjacencies? I mean, when you, when you have an, adjacently, an adjacency like this where neither are equal but both are adjacent, that's kind of like making a diagonal between the two coordinates. Anyway. As always, you know, you just, you have to choose whether you want to talk about C1 and C2. And when you're doing this, you just have to choose whether you want to talk about the NP1 product or the NP2 product. All right. Um, so the, our definitions require this to be continuous. But what I'm saying is it makes a difference. This is dependent. Uh, it's different depending on whether you're, you're using NP1 or NP2. Um, and uh, NP1, another way of thinking about this, NP1 is kind of like con continuous in each variable separately because this is the one in which two of the coordinates are, yeah, two of them in the pair have to be equal and you only change one of them. So this is kind of like continuity in each variable separately. Whereas when you use NP2, this is more like being continuous in both variables simultaneously. All right. So anyway, what I'm telling you is there are two different kinds of digital topological groups. There's the NP1 digital topological groups. That's the one where the continuity of the product uses the NP1 adjacency. And then there's the NP2 also, all right? Um, the NP2 is stronger. Uh, if you look through the, the definitions, this is easy to tell. So every NP2 digital topological group is a NP1, but it, the converse is not true. Um, the NP twos are the ones which are like continuous in both variables simultaneously. So actually those ones are like classical topological groups which require continuity in both variables simultaneously. Whereas the NP ones are more like quasi topological groups which are the weird ones in the in the classical theory. All right. Um, a little uh, diversion here. Maybe some people in the in the literature have suggested that you should just always use NP2 for everything and always use CN, that is the, the highest dimension, allowing all diagonals. There's, a, there's been a recent uh, series of papers written from this point of view, and they actually, they're able to prove very, very strong, sophisticated theorems, making the assumptions that you just always use all diagonals and all, always use NP2 for everything. Um, they, uh, and they kind of make a case in their papers that really, it's not even worth talking about C1 or NP1 because um, you don't get nice theorems from that. Um, they, uh, they made a simple observation, but it's kind of compelling. This, this function here, this is a very uh, useful function in topology and, and algebra, the diagonal map. It's just a diagonal of x equals x comma x. That's not even continuous if you're using the NP1 product. This is not hard to see, but you have to go through some work. It's only continuous if you use NP2. So what that means is if you're trying to copy some classical categorical constructions from topology or, you know, other things also, everything is, is generally going to work better if you use NP2. And a lot of stuff just breaks down if you're, if you're trying to do things using the NP1 because you can't even do this in a continuous way using the 
the NP1. So anyway, I'm just trying to say there's a school of thought that says we shouldn't, we should always do everything using the NP2. All right. Um, maybe NP2 digital topological groups, therefore, should be the the main category of focus, and we shouldn't even talk about the other ones. Or maybe the other ones are just kind of some sort of de degenerate weirdo cases. All right. But actually, that's not the case, and this was some. This was very interesting to uh, to me, at least, when we were working on the paper. Remember, the canonical example is this kind of circle uh, cycle graph. Actually, this one, if you look at pairs, say x zero comma x zero, just repeat this one, and then also x one comma x one, they are adjacent to one another, um, and so they are. Uh, these are NP2 adjacent because each one is adjacent to the other even though neither is equal. Uh, but when you multiply them together, multiply this pair together, you get X0. Multiply this pair together, you get X2. And X0 and X2 are not adjacent. What, um, what I'm saying here is actually this one, the standard example is not uh, continuous using the NP2. It is continuous using the NP1. So. Uh, this is this is interesting. Like I just said, there's a there's sort of a, a school of thought out there that says the NP2 are the only interesting cases, and everything else is is weird. But actually, in the digital topological groups, it turns out the NP1s are the interesting cases, and the NP2s they're not weird, but they're kind of degenerate, as I'll say in a moment. Uh, so, what does a NP2 digital topological group look like? Actually, this is a very um, uh, has a very complete answer to it in our paper. Any connected NP2 digital topological group must be a complete graph. So uh, as a graph, it's not terribly interesting. It has to look something like that. That means just there's edges connecting every, every pair of points is connected by an edge. That's for a connected NP2. Um, it's, you might say, as a topological space, this is kind of like a space with the indiscrete topology, which we, people don't really even talk about them because they're, they're too... Uh, too boring that there's not much interesting topology you can do on a on a space where everything is adjacent to everything else. All right, uh, connected NP2s are indiscrete. What about a disconnected? We can also prove because of the vertex transitivity, a disconnected would have to look like what they call a cluster graph. That is a disconnected union of complete graphs. So it's a, it might have a bunch of pieces, but all the pieces have to look the same, and they all have to be complete graphs. So this is still a very rigid uh, classification here, all right? In fact, you can, you can say a lot about the algebra. If you can see this picture, the components um, on this picture turned out to be, they turn out to be cosets of the identity component, which I'll call x1. So it turns out each indi um, the component of the identity is a normal subgroup of the whole group. And when you look at the, all the different components, this, uh, the fact that you can see these components arranged in this way tells you a lot about the subgroup structure of the original group. And it, like, for example, this picture, basically its group structure has to be Z3 cross Z5. Z3 is the group structure of each of the individual components, and then there's five of them. Um, we have some theorems in the, in the paper about this kind of thing. Uh, I will say, or something like that. It actually, it doesn't have to be a direct product here. It could be a semi-direct product or some something vaguely like that. But here's what it really means. There's some kind of exact sequence like this. I don't know if you care about that. But um, anyway, the NP2 digital topological groups are, are pretty easy to classify, and they're not very interesting because they're all basically indiscrete um, topological objects. All right, the NP2s are not very interesting. What about the NP1s? Actually, all of the interesting examples and all the standard examples are NP1s, but not NP2s. Um, this is different, like I said, from the classical topological groups where the, the NP1s correspond to the quasi-topological groups, which are the weird ones. In this theory, actually, the NP1s are the ordinary ones, um, which I, th I think is interesting. That was, that was a bit of a surprise to me, actually. I, when we started working on this, I, th I had assumed that the NP2 ones would be the, the main object, the, the main category of focus, but actually it turns out they're not interesting. The NP ones are. All right, the interesting category is the NP ones, not the NP twos for digital topological groups. This is the main this is the big uh, I would say like spiritual result of the paper. Like this isn't a theorem in the paper, but that's that's the takeaway from uh, from the paper. All right. The NP twos are easy to classify, like I said. What about the NP ones? Um, the standard example is one of these cycle graphs, which are the group is, uh, you know, Z mod N. 
Um, are there any more examples? And this, this, uh, there had not been other examples in the literature, and it took us a while to think about. But um, yes, there are other examples. Here's an example. This is uh, the dihedral group D8, realized as a digital topological group modeled on a on a cube like this. Um, you can check the continuity conditions. I mean, you have to you have to check it. But actually, the, this group operation is compatible with the adjacencies on that picture there. This is an NP1 digital topological group with the group structure of the dihedral group D8. Um, it turns out actually that's a special case of a more much more general construction. Any uh, there's a thing from uh, like combinatorial group theory. Any finitely presented group has something called a Cayley graph. There is a standard way to transform any finitely presented group into a graph. And actually, that is what you get when you do it to the dihedral group. The Cayley graph of the dihedral group is this is this cube. So this is a, uh, a speci specific example of a much more general construction. So for any finite group, we, we only care about finite things because we're looking at finite digital images. Um, the Cayley graph of any finite group can be turned into a digital topological group. Um, and if you do this, if you construct a digital topological group using a Cayley graph, it's basically never going to be NP2, it, but it's always going to be NP1. The only way it could could be end up being NP2 if it, is if, like, coincidentally, you get a complete graph, in, in which case the group would have had to be very, very stu uh, stupid group to give you a complete graph in the Cayley graph. All right, so all Cayley graphs are digital topological groups, and this is a huge class of examples, but the converse is not true. You can make a digital topological group, which is not a Cayley graph. Um, not all digital topological groups with, with group structure uh, like isomorphic to G, it doesn't mean that the graph is going to be the Cayley graph of G. Um, here's just a, an example. Th that same graph, uh, or that same group, the dihedral group, you can make a digital topological group out of it in several different ways. Like one way is by the Cayley graph. That's what I just showed you. But actually, you can, uh, these are sort of two stupid ways to do it. You can make a discrete version of that graph or an indiscrete version. And then the continuity conditions will be trivially satisfied here because there are either no adjacencies or everything is adjacent, and then the operations are automatically continuous. So th those are sort of stupid versions. I put them in red because those are actually NP2s. The blue ones are NP1s and the red ones are NP2s. Um, you can take two different quotients of D8 and use the information from the quotients to construct these two versions of the same gra uh, group. It turns out that those two, uh, those two approaches, one is like a quotient by the rotation part and the other is a quotient by the reflection part in the dihedral group. That gives you two other ways to, uh, to make this into a graph. And then um, there's probably others. Actually, this, I, we didn't, actually, this chart is not in the paper. And I didn't really try to prove these are the only ways to do it. I think probably they are not. But um, I'm just saying not every digital topological group is a Cayley graph. There are uh, other ways to do it. That's pretty much it for what's in this paper. I thought I might share with you. We've got a few minutes left. Our, our original idea for this paper actually didn't make it into the paper. The, the, it, it all began, I wrote an email to, uh, to Lee. I read something that he did, and I, I, I said, hey, um, you know, Professor Lee, I think, I think maybe I got an idea. And then he said, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Let's write a paper about it. That idea is not in the paper because it, it never worked out. Um, I'm, we're still thinking about it. But uh, the original idea was um, to create digital topological groups by discretizing the classical examples. Um, oh, here's another. Uh, this is another AI-generated um, photorealistic digital topological group. This doesn't really look like a digital topological group to me. But what I'm about to talk about is related to spheres. And so this I liked this. Um, Anyway, the circle is a topological group, and you can discretize it into that box, right? And as a group, you can think of this as the, um, the group of unit complex numbers, and you get, that's how you get that operation. Um, and you can discretize it, and what works out in this case, you can use this. I'm going to call it, this is the boundary of these um, intervals from minus 1 to 1, integer intervals in two dimensions. Um, that's what that is. Um, our original idea was S3 is also a topological group, the three-dimensional sphere. You can think of that as the group of unit quaternions. And so, like, my original email to Lee was, hey, do you think we could make 
a digital quaternion uh, thing. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, that should definitely work. And the, um, the original idea was to try to make something like a digital quaternion group out of something like this. Um, you do the same thing, but just in, in higher dimension. Um, so the picture of that would look something like this. This is a three-dimensional, so you have to imagine this, but one dimension higher um, would be the natural thing to try to model the quaternions on that. Um, there's an obvious problem, though, when we started working out the details and that is that um, this is not a vertex transitive graph. This has some, like the corners are degree three, but the, um, the other vertices are degree four, all right? So that, that means, and, and in the higher dimension, this is also true. It's not three and four, but whatever. Um, it means automatically this, this here cannot be a digital topological group. Um, so uh, this kind of rectangular box is not appropriate to approximate the uh, S3, the, the three sphere. So maybe there's some other way to discretize the three sphere that will be more appropriate. And um, we still don't really know how to do that. So we don't know what the, the proper digitization would be to turn it into a digital topological group. Um, and maybe maybe you just can't do it. I don't I don't really know. Um, more likely, and this is something that we are we're I wouldn't say working on, but thinking about working on. Uh, more likely, can be done as an H space. This is like a like a topological group, but you don't require that the inverses. Um, it's not required to have an inverse on the nose, but the operation has to be invertible up to homotopy. So it's like a topological group, but everything. Uh, has some kind of wiggle room in it um, up to homotopy. And in that case, an, a digital H space, this has been worked on by other people. So some work has been done by, Lee has some papers about digital H spaces and also Karaja. But uh, those papers don't really have any good examples in them. Like this, the circle is a digital H space, but that's the only, the only one that anybody ever talks about. Um, so there's, th this is something that we're still thinking about, although I, don't tell Lee I said this. I don't have any great ideas at this point, but it's, uh, it's, it's aspirational. All right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's even hard. That box, you can't even define a product that is continuous on it in a nice way. Obviously, uh, like a, a good product. You can make it some kind of degenerate product, but um, I think it's probably impossible just using the box. One strategy was maybe we should use lots more points so that it's not like a rectangular box, but some kind of giant but more sh more shapely spherical like thing that also didn't work um, several attempts none of them worked maybe in the future it will all right that's all I got to say um, our next uh, our next meeting is going to be in a, in two weeks Sean's going to talk about something or other but um, thank you all for coming and I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has